All right. Sorry about the delay there. Getting this thing up and running. Um, this this particular live session is a little bit more jam packed with content, so um, hope you like it. Thanks for being here. Um, hope you are doing well. I'm just gonna make sure my audio is audio is coming through. And it is. Uh, today, uh, more user um, submissions, questions that came in over the week. Um, how to use an ADC on Zephyr, and also some interesting thread control, uh, a thread control question. And uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe, hit that like button, and um, let me know what you think. I, I tailor these live sessions towards anybody who has any particular questions about Zephyr, how to use it, um, like today, wouldn't exist right now if I didn't have those questions um, from y'all from from this past week. So uh, you make this uh, happen. So I really appreciate all that, all the help and all the questions and everything that comes in during the week. You can leave a comment below or get, shoot me an email. Doesn't matter. Um, I'll leave all the information in the description box. So let's jump over to Slay. So let's kick it off. Um, could you make a video about using the ADZ uh, with Zephyr, please? So let's do it. Um, I am gonna grab, I almost forgot. Gotta grab. Oh, there's gonna be feedback. Like today? I'm just gonna grab the chat because I almost forgot that. Let's go. Um, so this kind of goes with every caveat. You, you, if you've seen these live sessions before, uh, you probably heard me say this, but make sure that um, if you're using a board, make sure that that board actually supports the peripheral that you want to use. Um, and also make sure that Zephyr also supports the, um, that particular peripheral. There might be, I run in instances like ESP32, um, last time I checked, does not support um, some microphones, embedded microphones using I2S. Um, so, those are just things that you just like run into. You're like, oh man, this is no support in Zephyr for this yet. So in this case, ADC um, usually uh, available and for anybody to use any processor, this is like baseline support for, this is like a peripheral that you, that's like required in many cases. Like it's like GPIO, it's, you know, ubiquitous. Um, so enabling ADC would be the first thing. And then um, also, oops. And uh, one thing you have to do is take a look at your data sheet and actually figure out, a lot of them are organized in like channels. You have one ADC peripheral, but they're spread out into different channels. Um, this is an NRF52 data sheet and you can see each pin is actually assigned to an analog input. Uh, your processor might be different depending on what you're using. I know Nordic generally uh, sets certain pins to be analog pins and that's what they are. You can use them as GPIO pins, but they also have that special functionality of being an ADC pin. Um, it really depends on what chip you're using. So we'll just that's what we're using here, and then uh, you'll you'll see where this is going. So <clears throat> I am using the sample from Zephyr using the ADC sample from Zephyr. So you can see the top here that. Um, you're, we're defining the Zephyr comma user and IO channels. This is generally is just a way to associate both the ADC and the, the, the channel. It's kind of fluff, uh, especially if you know the channel yourself inside the code. Uh, this is where the, like the blur, the line between overlay and also your, just your configuration can happen. Uh, in this particular ADC sample, the one that's just, uh, in the description box below, they're using this particular construct to essentially set whatever ADC you want and whatever channel. You don't necessarily have to do this in your own code, but it'll give you an idea and it shouldn't be able to at least get you started. The bigger thing, and this is probably the main problem that some of you might have with using maybe a custom board or um, a board that's defined to use a specific processor if it's not defined well, uh, it might not have an ADC defined and you'll get some crazy uh, device tree errors like 
DTS, OBJ, or ORB, not found. Like, that's that's literally what you're going to get. And this is what it is. It is, and actually I mentioned this in last week's video. I got a very similar error not defining the PWM module or PWM peripheral. So I got those very similar errors. So if you if, if you look at your board definition, uh, usually in the, the board definition area in Zephyr repo, and it does not have any reference to ADC, you're gonna to have to add it in your overlay. Uh, very, 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 very important. Otherwise, you won't be able to use the ADC. You'll just get created, you'll just get these cryptic um, uh, device tree errors, which are not useful at all. So check it and double check and make sure that you have both of these things defined. Uh, this is where it gets a little hairy and I tried to put, bring it out into kind of chunks so you can understand. A lot of this should look very familiar. Um, just getting the, so what we're doing is we're getting that node using the device DT get macro uh, that should look fairly familiar for everyone. Um, if, you, if you're unfamiliar, feel free to check my previous videos on um, developing drivers and things like that because it uses the same device struct construct where you're getting a device from the over, from your device tree, uh, either through your overlay or your board definitions, and then you're using it within your code. Um, and then we're just making sure the device is ready. This is something that, um, like I said, this is something I went over before, but you are checking to make sure, okay, we're defining that device at, run, at uh, compile time, but we're just gonna make sure that it's like working correctly. Because a lot of the time on the back end, or when the device is starting up, you actually have these initialization, initialization uh, functions that will turn on the functionality as it goes. And if there's any errors, uh, this is basically checking for if there's any errors with that particular device. So, um, And I mentioned this before, but yeah, you don't have to use this Zephyr user, but it uh, organizes it a little bit better and you can kind of make it so if you have different platforms, different uh, processors, you can kind of take advantage of it. So, uh, next step is actually getting the uh, settings. So, uh, this will differ for your particular application. You can, um, if you go into like, especially if you're using VS Code, you can actually click on these definitions and like pop go into the adc.h and actually see what uh, options there are available for you. Um, the gains. It's really dependent on your application, either within internally of your of your of the chip or externally in hardware. You can also um, set some hardware stuff in there too, if you have like an external resistor divider or things like that. Um, and also setting the reference. It's all dependent on your particular application. Um, I just these are the defaults in that sample. You can look at the sample. Uh, I just leaving them default. And then um, because they were defining multiple channels. I just made it simpler for this particular presentation and I just uh, got the channel using this, um, the DTIO channels input and just getting that first index. <clears throat> um, if you're only using one channel, this is kind of the way to do it. Uh, they actually did it where they put it in a, they were populating an array with that same function. But if you're just using one channel, you can do it that way too. Uh, then, so, those are all macros that were basically used in this ADC channel config. This is the way you're going to set up your ADC. ADC. Um, you're setting the gain, you're setting the reference, you're setting the time, you're setting the uh, the channel. And then if you're using differential, uh, zero, uh, you know, zero, zero, it's off, one is on. Um, differential is dependent on your device. So uh, if you are making differential measurements, you have to make sure that your device actually supports it. So And you have to have it on the right pins that support differential measurements. I don't know if, I believe the Nordic devices have differential. Uh, and then what we're gonna do here is for, um, if you're ever using an NRF device, it's most likely gonna be using the NRFX drivers. And um, one little extra step here, you just gotta define, it's like an offset from the, it's like the input positive. Uh, I don't know much about this particular added um, Bit, I mean, entry in the struct, but it's obviously needed for um, using ADC operation on the Nordic, on any Nordic chip. So if you're having problems with any Nordic chip using ADC, you might have to make sure that this is being set as well. 
And then once all that stuff, we're, so we're using that configuration struct and we're actually putting it and we're running the ADC channel setup. This will just set up with the parameters that you just set. And then it should be ready to roll. Um, so when you're making measurements, you just have to uh, define the, a sample buffer, how many samples are, you're taking, and also the, any type of the resolution and um, the channel that you're targeting, uh, because you can have multiple channels initialized at once. Um, this is like the parameter to when you're issuing a measurement command, a struct when you're doing it. And then um, it's that it's reading back out to that sample buffer pointer where then you can access the data as long as it's not failed um, reading. So you can see we're using it here, ADC read, we're using that first parameter as the device um, kind of defined earlier, that device DT get, and then that sequence is that sequence struct. And then we're just checking for errors. <clears throat> If there's any errors, we're going to return. We're, we don't want to process any of that um, any of that buffer because it doesn't have any good real data in it. Um, so you just want to like exit or, you know, if you're in an infinite loop of some kind, maybe continue. It really depends on your application. But this will, uh, in it will synchronously read the ADC, however many samples that you indicated, depending on your buffer size, and then it will finish. You can check the errors and then you can actually go through the samples and read the samples and do whatever you want with the samples. Um, in this case, for this particular sample and the, um, and the Zephyr SDK vanilla one, uh, they're actually just reading uh, the sample buffer. They're, then they're looking at the raw value, which is basically just the, um, the, the number of ticks and the ADC, and then there, what it's doing is you can use this ADC um, conversion function, ADC raw to millivolts, and depending on your gain and your resolution and the hardware bits that we, we've kind of defined earlier, you can convert that to an actual millivolt level. And in many cases, I personally use, use the millivolt level versus using maybe a double of converting um, you know, to volts. That way you can use like a new N32 or an N32 uh, where um, it's easier to represent, it's easier to send over the cloud because you're not dealing with doubles because doubles are, what, they can be up to 60, um, 64 bits instead of 32. So it just takes up a little bit more space. Um, and they're just harder to work with in general, so. Um, so you can set, make sure you set your overlay configuration accordingly. Make sure you have, uh, sure, I'm going to underline again, make sure that you have your ADC or make sure that the ADC is declared somewhere or make sure that you do declare the ADC if it's not. Um, make sure that your chip and the Zephyr drivers support an ADC uh, for the most case should, um, but you never know if you're using some type of esoteric chipset that see sequence and targeting that your particular buffer. Um, one thing I didn't show was actually setting up it's just a UN8 buffer, um, I think, with and you just set the size and then it'll the, the data width is. And then um, using the ADC channel setup to start, set everything up, then using read. And then also if you're converting, you want to use that convert to millis um, millis function. It's just a helper function. There's no, you're not calling the ADC to do that conversion. It's just a uh, mathematical uh, done by the CPU. So I'm not sure if that did anything or not. Let's see if it's back up here. And I'll just make sure that it's. Live TV, the advantages of it. Let me see if this is better. Yeah, okay. Just make sure that it's... Oh yeah, it's pretty jumpy. I don't know what's going on. Sorry, all. This is a pain. Um, we'll just have to. I'll just power through because I have no control over what's happening here. Wi-Fi, which will kill it for a second. Otherwise. 
realize I have no idea what the heck is going on. Must be a YouTube thing. All right, well, I'm just going to keep powering through. Hopefully, the um, at least you guys can hear the audio, and I should be able to at least see the slides. Um, I have absolutely no control over what's happening right now. Um, so we'll just jump into the next question. She, um, this is Sarah. She said you wanted a periodic function, um, but on a button press, essentially she wanted to end, like, kill the current thread and start a new function. Um, and it seemed like she was using the system work queue to do this. So she had a like persistent running task in the system work queue. And Sarah, uh, if I got this wrong, please correct me. But um, and so we'll, we'll dive into it, but it sounded like she had some type of persistent task running in the system work queue and then she wanted to kill it when a button was pressed and then run something else. Uh, that's not quite what the system work queue is for. The, the tasks need to eventually end or yield. So, and actually I take back the yield part. They just need to end at some point. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll jump into this. Um, <laughs> my recommendations, and I think it's across the Zephyr ecosystem, don't use the work queue for long running tasks. The work queue is actually used by other parts of the system. Think logging, think other parts of the system that just needs to be periodically run that you generally have no control over. Um, yeah. um, I'm just looking at my right hand corner here. It's saying my, I'm dropping a bunch of frames. That's probably why you guys can't see me very well. Uh, but I'll keep the I'll keep the slides up. Um, hopefully the audio will still be good for you. Um, let me get back to the slide job. Um, so use the threads for, um, so you want to use threads for longer running tasks and any, um, long running task, you must, there, you must yield at some point to allow other things to actually run. Um, that is very important. Um, dang it. Dun, 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 dun. I'm just checking some settings here. I've literally haven't changed any settings for, uh, OBS, so it's very weird that things are not working correctly. It's blinking red at me here, though. It's saying I'm uploading at 614 kilobits per second. That's great. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. This is really probably really tough to watch. Um, but I'm just going to keep plugging along because I have no control over it. Uh, so yeah, you have to yield in your in your threads so they can execute properly. Um, so this is just kind of referencing, I have gone over work queue threads and things like that previously. You can check out the link below in the description box. But uh, here is the work submit command for the system work, work queue. And um, you can also cancel tasks, but cancel does not stop something once it's been started. So if you have a long running task, it's not gonna, um, it's not gonna work. Uh, because it's it's going to continue running until it actually stops execution itself. You can't just you can't cancel a task once it's started. Uh, but if it hasn't started yet, you you can of course cancel it. Uh, some alternatives you can use you can use a main thread to handle events across your applications. So you have things that are generate events across your application, and then they can be sent right to your uh, main processing thread. Um, you can see the th previous video on this. I also included a link in the description box. And also you can use separate threads to process events in real time. Um, and I'll just show a quick example of that. Um, hopefully not too painfully for you guys. Uh, here is me, I'm just defining a quick Excel acceleration um, for accelerometer measurement. Um, here's a little quick thread definition. The, the name of the thread is called Excel event process. And um, what we're doing is uh, we have a separate button handler that way you hit the button and then it allows, it uses a semaphore and it basically releases that semaphore um, so that execution can continue in that thread. And you'll see what I mean here. Um, so here is the Excel event process. It is a infinite loop, while loop, and it, it basically yields at this k sem take. So this, this stays here forever until 
your the semaphore is released and you actually it gives a value and then it takes that value and it sets it back to zero and then it's allowed to do an ex, you know a loop of execution so then it does something and it loops back to the front and then it stops when it stops it yields to the other processes processes in your application which allows them to do their own processing um, this is a like a critical piece of operating system kind of 101 like how do you control threads um, in different contexts uh, semaphores are a fantastic way to do that um, so keep that in mind and what you can do is like i said like you can use a like, button event to actually trigger a run a long running thread to only execute when you need it to um, so if you have and i so in this case, we're keeping all the threads and we're keeping we're keeping everything, but we're only executing when we need to. Um, now, there are oh, there's a way that you actually can kill a thread. You can basically break from it or let it fall through. For example, um, here is a main loop with a with an infinite loop in it, and then if I if somewhere along the line there's a break statement, it'll break from it and then fall through and finish and basically terminate the thread. Um, but once you kill a thread. You can't get it back unless you read a re uh, at least for the main thread. If you want to like reallocate and um, generate the thread again, you can do that in runtime. Um, don't recommend it. Uh, it does free up stack space for other threads to use. So some people and Zephyr uses use the main thread as an initialization thread. Once it goes away, that memory is released for all your other th um, threads in your application, and uh, it allows a um, more uh, the more dynamic your thread control, like if you're creating threads and killing them uh, dynamically in your application, you might run into issues with stack space and things like that. So I recommend keeping it simple. Uh, static is generally better in most cases. So, um, so hopefully people can hear that. How do you, so, uh, we've gone over how to use the ADC on Zephyr, enable the ADC peripheral, we're using the overlay, making sure that the ADC is actually defined, um, and then API calls inside your code uh, to read and also set up the ADC. Um, we've also gone over thread review, uh, control review, we're stopping and uh, spawning and stopping tasks and threads, and uh, some important differences with work queue and thread ex execution. Um, so that is it for today, unfortunately. Um, hopefully, so you guys at least heard me and got to at least read the slides. I think those are the most important parts. Um, but uh, thank you all for being here. I see Franz, Acostas, Androby, the famous Androby, um, Jim, and uh, yeah, thanks for being here, everybody. And I'm gonna figure this, whatever, maybe my, my modem downstairs needs to be rebooted or something. I'm not sure what's going on there. Maybe it's just a OBS thing. I'm not really sure. Hopefully it'll be better for next week. Maybe I'll test it beforehand. Um, thank you all for your support. Of course, if you have any suggestions for next week or whenever, um, send me an email. Sh uh, write a comment below. Um, and we'll see you next week. Thanks again. Oh, questions, questions, questions. Um, I'll, I will answer your questions, Franz. Um, how about how about submitting a thread in an interrupt um, instead of letting a thread waiting on a semaphore? Um, depending on how you're submitting it. What do you mean by submitting it? Um, you can actually so if you have not only have the system work queue. But you have you can create your own work queues where you can actually uh, you can submit to your work queue and that's just a thread that does processing in the background. So you can submit from an interrupt context and do it that way. That is definitely one way to do it. Um, I was just showing the semaphore because semaphores are handy and they are used everywhere. But um, and also a very important concept to understand. But yeah, there's a couple of different ways you can you can get a th get some type of uh, thread moving from an interrupt context like that. Um, so there, there's definitely not just one way to do it. Uh, I'm just, just showing one way to do it, but uh, you can ch I'm, you can check out the work queue video that I did before and hopefully that should um, shed some light on um, for anybody who needs to learn more. I know Franz, you probably know what you're talking about here, but 
other people who might not, um, they might want to check out that video as well. Yeah, placing it in its own creative work queue. Uh, yeah, you would have to, I don't have that here, obviously, but um, you can create your own work queue and then you can submit to your own work queues and that will free up the system work queue to do its own thing so you don't block the system work queue. Um, blocking the system work queue is bad. You don't want to do that. So I hope that uh, helps for anybody who has any questions about uh, the um, using the work or just submitting tasks in general. You just want to make sure they're not blocking. You don't want to make sure you want to make sure that it's not running for a long time. Um, you have to make sure it yields in some way. So Semaphore is a good way to do that. Or uh, if you have like discrete tasks, you can submit them to your own work queue. Um, you just want to make sure you're not blocking other important parts of your of your Zephyr RTOS. So, and we'll see if there's any other comments or questions. Cool. I know there's a delay, so. And my 947 kilobits per second upload. So weird. All right, I will uh, end this pain for you guys uh, and I will figure this out, but uh, I hope you have a great week and we'll see you next week. And if you, um, yeah, just if you have any suggestions or questions as you go, out th go throughout your week, send me an email, shoot, uh, you know, leave a comment here and I'll use them. I'll talk about them next week. So thank you all for being here and I'll see you in the next one. And this time I won't leave.